Now, today we're going to finish off our, our series that we've been in. The series is called Re-Energize, and it's God's direction to re-energize our life. And the message for today is called Refocusing Our Priorities. So we're going to end off the entire series by looking at this idea that we should be focused on what God wants to do in and through our life. Now, before we do that, uh, would you please pray, for, pray with me for the, for the now? For, we'll pray for the, the actual teaching. Let's pray. Father, we just want to thank you so much. We thank you, Father, that we get to be together here today. To understand that you are the, the source of life, you're the source of energy, and you're the source, Father, that, uh, of purpose for us. We pray that today, that as we're able to step back and to uh, evaluate where we are in our relationship with you, Father, that we're able to, to get things realigned if something is not aligned correctly. Father, if, if for, for people that are here today, and maybe they're just tired, they're going through their life and they're just exhausted, and I pray that today that you will bring an energy into their life to show them that you have a plan, you have a purpose. And uh, as long as they stay focused on what you want for them, Father, and they're focused on your will for their life, Father, you will give them what they need to accomplish it. And we thank you so much for that. And again, we love you with all of our heart. We pray so in Son, Jesus' name, amen. Now, again, if you want to take out your notes out of your program there, you see that the title for today's message is Refocusing Our Priorities. Now, over the last uh, few weeks, I've been watching the NBA uh, playoffs. And for one, I love basketball. I always thought I would be either an NFL football player or I thought I would be a, uh, a NBA basketball player. The only problem with both of those is I was too small, not fast enough, and I had no skill. Outside of that, you know, I really thought I had a chance to make it to the NBA. And so I could really appreciate these guys who really work hard in their, then the NBA you know, finals right now. And I was watching the, 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 um, the playoff series between the Bucks and the Toronto Raptors. And what was wild is this, is that the Bucks, uh, the, they won the first two games. They were up 2-0 in, in the series. It's the best out of seven, so everyone's four games first. And so they were up two games to zero, and the Bucks were just destroying them. I mean, that game that they won, the second game, they beat them by like, you know, 18 points. It was just, it was embarrassing. I was like, man, Toronto Raptors, they look done. They look tired. Their legs look wobbly. And I'm like, okay, you know, it, it's over. And then what was wild is that the Raptors came back and they won the next game. And then the Raptors came back and they won the next game after that. Now, if you, have, if you have this recorded at home and you want to know what happened in the series and you don't know yet, plug your ears, okay, because I'm about to spoil it for you. Okay, the Raptors won the series four games to two. That, it was the craziest thing. They couldn't do anything. The first two games, they looked tired. They looked exhausted. People were saying, I know why they're so tired. They're done. And the reason they're done is because the, game, the series before this, um, it went seven games. And they actually, the only way they made it to the next round of the playoffs is Kawhi Leonard threw up a shot. And it literally bounced off the rim a couple times. And then finally bounced in. He's like, they're just done. But here's the wild thing is that after the second game, and they were down 0-2, things changed. You saw like a spark. You saw them get refocused. You saw them have an energy, and they were running up and down the court, and they won the next four games. So they asked the coach, they're like, how did this happen? You know, how is it? And he said, well, you know what? They had it in them, but we lost our focus. See, see what ended up taking place is that they had everything that they needed to, to, to succeed, but we got so distracted, so overwhelmed that, that we couldn't focus on what we needed to do. So all I did is I reminded them of what we need to do, get refocused, and it's the wildest thing. Because they got refocused, they now had the energy and they went on to win the series. And I thought about the same thing is true in our life. How oftentimes that the reason we don't accomplish what God wants for our life has nothing to do with the energy. Maybe our energy is sapped and we're tired and we're going, I don't see how I can add another thing to my list. But maybe the problem is this, is God just wants to get us refocused. That when we refocus on what God wants for our life, how God will give us this incredible energy to keep moving forward. And that's the difference between success and failure in living out God's will for our life. So that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about how to stay focused on what God wants for us. Now, it's not going to be easy. There's all kinds of distractions. So today we're going to talk about how to ignore the distractions and stay focused on what God wants for us. And we're going to look at that by looking at Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. So in your text there, you see in Matthew 6, 33, Jesus says this. He says, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and then all these things will be added to you. What's interesting is that this verse right here, and actually if you look through Matthew 6, it's actually talking about money. It's talking about worry about material possessions. And, and so right before this, Jesus explains to him, look, be careful because, you know, about the love of money. He says, be careful because in, in, in Matthew 6, 24, it says that you can't serve two masters. You would either love one and hate the other. You would despise one and, uh, uh, and, and, and you know, um, and follow one and not follow the other. He says, you cannot, you'll be divided. He says, so here's the thing. You can't serve both God and money. He said, be careful because material possessions can pull you away, get you distracted. And then he turns around in Matthew 6, and says, now listen, you don't have to worry about stuff. Here's what you got to do. 
He says, if you want to not be worried, you don't want to be stressed out, you don't want to be tapped to the point where you have nothing left, he says, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. So it says there, first, seek, seek first God's kingdom and God's righteousness. His righteousness means that we understand who God is. We understand how incredible God is, and we're going to talk about that today. That when we understand more and more of who God is and what God wants to do, it changes everything, changes our entire perspective. But then he also said there, now also seek out God's kingdom. So, so what is God's kingdom? Because I've asked a lot of Christians, I said, can you, ask, you know, answer for me? Like if somebody was to ask you and said, hey, the Bible talks about God's kingdom, what exactly does that mean? A lot of Christians can't answer that. Here, here's all it is. Very simple. God's kingdom is where God's will is being done. That's it. Because a kingdom, think about it. A king is over his kingdom. That means that if that is his kingdom, it means that whatever he says, that's what, what's being done. So as we focus on God's kingdom, where God's will is done, yes, we're talking about in heaven. In heaven, God's will is done. But you know that the same thing is true each and every day of our life, that as we pursue, if we don't want to be worried, we have to pursue each and every day to allow God's will to be done in our life. What God wants for us, we're going to focus on that. And that's where worry goes away. That's where God helps us to do those, you know, the, 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 the game that's gonna, that you think you're done, but you're going to have the energy to keep moving forward. Now, it's not easy. It's not easy. And oftentimes people believe that as we focus on God, you know, they look at God as, as if, you know, as, as a to-do list. You know, like, okay, so here's my to-do list for this week. I have, you know, I'm going to go grocery shopping. I got to go take the car to the mechanic. I'm going to go do something incredible for God. I'm going to take the kids to school. It's like, it's like, you know, just kind of toss God in there in some way, shape, or form. But that's not what God wants for us. See, God doesn't want to just be another thing on the to-do list. Uh, I heard somebody use this analogy like 10, 15 years ago. It was incredible. What they said is this, <clears throat> is that every single one of us uh, in our life, you have to look at your life like a wheel that has spokes. And, and too often what we do is we, we believe that God's just another spoke, that God is just one part of, this, of every area of our life. God does not want to be just one part. He doesn't want to be one spoke in our life. He wants to be the hub that everything is connected to, that, 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 that everything that we do is connected to God. Everything that we do, is that we always go back and go, what does God want for me? How does God want me to, 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 to do this thing? And when we, he is the hub God will make all those other things, the other things work out. That's why I said there, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and then all these things will be added to you. You don't have to worry. Why? Because God as the hub has it all covered, but we have to keep him as the hub. And here's one thing I've noticed in my life, that whenever I'm stressed out, that whenever I've been worried, it's because God in my mind and sometimes in my heart has shifted to another spoke. It's been like, you know, where God has been the hub of my life and he was there at the center of it all, but then all of a sudden God is something I'm doing. You know, like, I'm going to church, I'm doing this thing. And he just becomes another spoke. And, and today, if that's you, if you're going, yeah, I kind of feel that way. Listen, today we're talking about how to make him the hub. How to bring him back to the center of everything that you do. You know, it's interesting. If you look at Matthew chapter 3, verse 2, it's right there on your notes. In Matthew 3, 2, it says this. It says, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. I love this. So it's talking about, again about the kingdom of God. It says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. This is John the Baptist is actually talking about this and he's preparing people for the coming of Jesus. He's saying, there's someone's about to come right now and this can be incredible. And he says, you need to repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now the word repent in this context is, is the Greek word matanael, matanael, which literally means to change the way you think and the way you act, to get refocused. That's what it means. It means that maybe you're going away from God. You're going in the wrong direction. And now to repent literally means you turn back around. You change the way you think and you change what you're doing. You start heading back to what God wants in your life. See, that's a refocus. He's saying, you're focused on that. Let's get you refocused. Let's get you back to where you need to be. Get you back on the priorities that God wants for your life so you can live the life that God intended for you to live. Now, I've had people ask me, they said, so, so how do we do this? Because I have a, a head knowledge of God. I know scripture and stuff. So how do we make God the hub? Well, if you think about the hub's in the center, it's incredible because so is our heart. See, that's where it all begins. See, it's not just about understanding theology. It's not just about studying hermeneutics and studying apologetics and trying to, you know, so we can have all the facts and all the answers to prove the, the Bible. It's about giving God our life. Listen to what it says here in Jeremiah 29, 13. It says there, you will seek me and you will find me when you search for me with all your heart. God wants our heart. See, and when God has our heart, our priorities begin to change. Think about this. If someone has your heart, things change. 
When, when I met my wife and she had my heart, things changed in my life. Like I wanted stuff for myself and all of a sudden I, it's like I wanted to include her in it. When I, when I had kids, something happened in my life where I was like, things begin to change. I started thinking of them and how is this going to affect them? Why? Because they had my heart. But you know what's crazy? Here's what I've realized. Is that you can give someone your heart, but have you ever noticed how quickly your heart can drift? Where all of a sudden you're doing stuff again and you're kind of like, uh, uh and, and maybe you're, you're still kind of involved, but, you're, but, but things aren't the priority. Maybe the priority now is stuff that you want rather than what is best for them. I believe that's happens in our relationship with God as well. That there are times when we have to get refocused, get our heart refocused to what God wants for us. And so today, that's what it's about. Today's really just a heart check. Today is for us to step back and to, just to check our priorities, check our focus. Are we where we need to be? And, and so if you're here today and you're thinking, look, I know that God hasn't been the center of my life. I'm hoping that today will inspire you to make him the center. And we're going to show you the benefit that it is to you and the benefit it can be to the impact that you can have to the world around you. So let's get started by looking at this. We're going to look today at four factors, four factors uh, for a change of heart. So, so we can have the heart, the life that God intended. The first one is this. God uses, God uses pain for a change of heart, pain. Now, this is one that we, none of us like. We don't like pain. We don't, but, but God will use pain in our life to get us refocused. It can be relational pain, physical pain, financial pain, emotional pain. Because here's one thing I've realized about human nature. You know that there are times in our life where we won't change our direction until we feel pain. You know that, that sometimes pain is good in our life. I know you're thinking that's crazy. Now, the actual feeling of pain isn't good. But, but the reality is this, is that pain can be good because it stops us from keep going in a direction that can be harmful to us. No, I'll give you an example. All right, if, if you uh, put your hand on top of the stove, on the fire, you're going to feel pain. Now, here's what the pain is telling you. Move your hand, dummy. Yeah, that's what it's telling you right there, right? It's telling you, you get your hand out of there because the, if you leave, if you did not feel pain, the sensation of pain when the fire was there, it would literally cause permanent damage to you. So the pain helps you to avoid a bigger permanent damage. But it's crazy because a lot of us, it's like we can feel, we can be in pain, we can be in chaos, and we stay in it. And we stay in it. You know why? Because if, you, if you're around it so much, it just becomes what you're used to. You, know, you, you get very comfortable with chaos. It reminds me of something that happened this last week. Uh, my youngest daughter, uh, Destiny, uh, got promoted from eighth grade to now a, a freshman. So we have all high schoolers and college age, you know. So, so Destiny now got promoted to, to, to um, high school. And at her promotion, there was this, you know, I was sitting towards the back, or sitting towards the back, and there was a lady that had, this, had this, little, this little girl. And the little girl was probably, I don't know, three years old or so. You know, wasn't a baby anymore. But and you can see because she was talking, saying, I want this, I want it. And this lady, this little girl started screaming. I'm talking about screaming. And I'm over here going, does anyone else hear this? You can see the people around her looking at her like, what are you doing? And here's what the mom was doing. This little girl was going crazy. I was trying to listen to, you know, they're, gonna, they're talking about, you know, doing the whole ceremony. They're going to call kids names. And, and this lady, here's what she was doing the whole time. I'm like, that's not working. Yeah, that's not working. All right. And here's the wild thing. Because she was used to all the noise, she was oblivious. She was just like, yeah, this is just what you're used to. And I realized that that's, not, that's what happens to us sometimes when it comes to bad situations in our life. The reason we don't step out of that bad situation is we're going, I'm kind of used to it already. And it's, it's harming us, it's hurting us, it's, it's breaking our relationships, but this is what we're used to. So, so the, you know what happened to that lady? Is that somebody who was actually working that, that, that uh, ceremony walked over to her, tapped her on the shoulder and said, um, excuse me, is there anything we can do for you, help your, help your child? It turns out the baby just needed to go to the bathroom. That, that, that's what it was yelling. And so took the baby out, came back in, the baby was perfect. The baby was perfect. So here's what I've realized, that when it comes to pain, sometimes God uses pain to tap us on the shoulder and say, hey, hey, is there something you need to take care of? Do you need to go to the bathroom? No, not, not that really that. You know, but it, sometimes, man, it hurts when you have to go to the bathroom. So, you know, but, but what God is saying is there's something right now that you need to get out of your life. Now, I'm not saying that all pain is good because the Bible very much describes a spiritual battle. We're going to do a study in Ephesians chapter 6. I'm going to do it this summer. I want to make sure I do that. In Ephesians chapter 6, where it talks about the spiritual battle and that there's an enemy that's always trying to mess us up. You know, so I'm not saying that all pain is good. There's the enemy tries to distract us 
You know, Genesis chapter 50, verse 20 is one of my favorite verses. Genesis 50, 20, it says there that you meant this for evil, but God will use this for good so that by this very moment, many people will be saved. See, what that says is that there's, that, that, that there's someone that will intend for our harm, but God can use, still use it for good. You know how God uses it for good? Where are we focused through it? That's how God uses it for good. And so, so I'm not saying all pain is good, but there is some pain that God uses for our good. Listen to what it says here in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 14, or verse 10, it says this. For the kind of sorrow God wants us to experience. See, God wants us to experience some sorrow. You kind of go, what? But here's why. Leads us away from sin and results in salvation. There it is. God is saying, right now, I need you to go through this so that it's, you know, take your hand off the fire. I want you to experience that so you can go and it leads you to salvation. It's going to lead me to save you through this situation. It's going to lead to you and I being in heaven for all of eternity. And it says that type of sorrow, there's no regret for that kind of sorrow. But worldly sorrow, which lacks repentance, results in spiritual death. But if it's pain for the sake of pain, it just leads us away. He says, but there is some certain pain that God uses in our life to get us redirected. Now, the pain isn't good. Please know that. It drives me crazy. I hear, I hear Christians they do this sometimes. They're going through a horrible time and they're like, I, I just love that I'm going through this pain. I'm going, don't tell anybody that because you're weird. Yeah. <laughs> the pain isn't fun. Pain is pain. Pain doesn't feel good. That's not what it said. It didn't say enjoy the pain. It said there that through the pain, God's going to lead you to an amazing end result. See, that's what he's talking about, that the end result will be good. You know, several years ago, I had a friend of mine he and his family went down to Mexico, and, uh, and when they were down there, his wife got really sick. And so his wife was going through a, a horrible amount of pain. She, like, they said that she almost, almost blacked out. She started sweating, was, was, you know, just in such pain. They ended up taking her, uh, you know, tried to take her to a doctor. They ended up driving her back to the U.S. to, to figure out what was going on. They were down there on vacation, so they, they just called. It was that first day they got there. They get back here. They take her to the hospital, and they said that that horrible pain was that the, her appendix was about to burst. It actually was already having issues. They already started uh, being toxic. And if they didn't get it out right then, she could have died. They said, literally, the, the fact that you felt that pain is what saved your life. Exactly. So maybe right now, you're going through some pain. One of the first things that we do as we're going through pain is, first of all, ask ourselves this question. Is there something in my life that God wants me to get out of it? Because a lot of us, let's admit, we'll have painful situations, and we're the cause of it. You know, we're in a bad place. We're having relational pain, but we keep choosing the wrong people. You know, we, you know we, we are in this pain where our family's falling apart, but we're stuck in that addiction. We, you know, maybe there's, there's, there's something happening in your life that God is saying, I'm trying to use this to tap you on the shoulder and get you refocused on my purpose for your life. Now, again, it's not all pain. So if, but if you're going through pain, you're saying, look, I'm following God with everything I've got. Know this, that the enemy's going to attack you. That's what I talked about. But God can still use this for good. Just stay focused on him. That's the first thing. The second thing is this. What God uses to get us focused and change our heart is we have to believe that God wants our best. This is one of the key things that you must do. You must believe that all God wants your best, especially as you're going through a tough time. Because we live in a world that doesn't believe this, just so you know. We live in a world that believes that if there is a God, that God wants us miserable. And normally the reason they say that is they look at the issues and the problems of the world and they go, you look at all the problems, you know, so if God is real, then God is a bully, and because look at all the bad stuff that happens in our life. They don't even take into account that that's not even what the Bible says. Because the Bible talks about that God created this place, a perfect place, the Garden of Eden, where we could have dwelt there forever. Everything would have been perfect. But we chose sin. We are the ones that rejected God. We messed everything up. But who are we blaming? We're always blaming God. I remember that movie, The Usual Suspects. One of the things that it said in it is this. At the end of the movie, the bad guy says the biggest trick the devil ever played was convincing the world that he doesn't exist. Why? Because then you blame God for everything. Who's going to want to draw near to a God if you think you're, he's always picking on you and wants you miserable? That's why it's so important that Jesus reminds us that he is our heavenly father, that he loves us. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7, you know, please write this down. It's not on your notes. 1 Peter 5, 7, it says, cast your burdens on God. Why? Because he cares for you. He cares so much for you. That's why we cast our burdens on God. So please know this. God wants our best. So sometimes people say, well, maybe God doesn't want us miserable, but maybe God just doesn't care what I'm going through. God does care. If there's anything I want you to walk away with today is this. God cares about you. God loves you. God wouldn't have sacrificed his son on a cross if you weren't that important. 
And listen to what it says here in Isaiah chapter 48, verse 17. In Isaiah 48, 17, it says, I am the Lord, your God, who teaches you what is best for you, who directs you in the way you should go. See, God directs us in the way that we should go. Why? He said it right there. Because he teaches us what is best for us. See, whenever you see something in the Bible and you go, I don't want to do that, that's your sinful nature wanting to go in the opposite direction. That's those, these are the times where we go back and we trust. God wants what's best for me. Now, let's admit, we don't like that. A lot, half, maybe half the, the people here today are going, yes, I love that God wants my best. But some of us today, we, we probably remember back to when we were kids and, and when we were kind of spoiled a little bit. And we didn't want to hear that. I got to tell you, when I was a kid, I didn't want to hear my mom telling me, you know, I, I know what's best for you. Because usually when she said, I know what's best for you, it meant I don't get to have fun. Right? I mean, there were times when, when I wanted to eat. I want, I want you to know something. As a kid, I wanted to eat nothing but sweets. That's what I wanted. I was actually very malnutrition. I had to get shots to, to, for, for nutrition. And my mom would try to make me eat healthy food, and I hated you know, healthy food. I didn't want to eat healthy food. And so she would always try to you know, tell me, this is good for you. I know what's best. And she would give me these things, and part of it is because nobody else wanted it. They would always give it to us. Uh, it was canned spinach. I hated it. It was nasty. But I ate often. Part of the reason she said, look, this is what's best for you. You need to eat it. And I remember at a meeting, I'm like, man, this is, this, this is horrible. And she told me something. I think she tricked me. Because here's what she said. She goes, you want to be like Popeye? You need, you need to eat it. And I said, yes, I want to be like Popeye. I don't care how misproportioned his arms are. Why are this section way bigger than his biceps? I don't know how to get it. But, but I wanted to be like Popeye, you know? And so I was like, yes, I want to be like Popeye. So I would eat spinach. I remember going, man, what's best for me stinks. You know, and there are times when we, when we think of God that way. That, that God is going, here's what's best for you. I'm taking all your fun away, but that is not accurate. You know that God is also after our joy? That God wants us to be happy. That God wants to give us his best. That, listen to what it says here in Romans chapter 15, verse 13, on the back part of your notes there. It says, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him. As that you may uh, overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. I want you to see that's what God wants to give you. See, God is saying, look, I want your best, and I want to lead your life. I want you to have joy. You know what? Sometimes the joy of later requires us not to be happy right now. See, we don't, a lot of us, we don't want joy. We don't want deep joy. You know what we want? We just want to be happy right now. And we'll settle for happy in the moment when God says, look, right now in this moment, eat the spinach. It's doing something in you that later on you're going to see the benefit of. See, now today, I know the nutrition that it had, the, the, the food that my mom was giving me, the healthy part that she was giving me. And listen, now I'm not malnutritioned, as you can tell. I, now I love food, right? And, and so, but that's the thing is this, is God wants our best. I want you to know something. Maybe someone here today, you're going through something. And maybe that's just exactly what you need to hear. I wanted you to know that God loves you. And God always has your best interest in mind. That's the second thing. Let's look at the third thing. The third thing that God uses is this, is that we need to know God's truth, knowing God's truth. Listen to what it says here in Proverbs chapter 15, verse 14. It says, a wise person is hungry for knowledge. The word knowledge in this context is the word truth. So a wise person is hungry for truth while the fool feeds on trash. So a wise person is hungry for truth but while the fool feeds feeds on trash. And I thought about this. See, there's the choice to eat. We can, spiritually, we can, we can consume truth or we can consume trash. Those are the two options. And both of those are around us every single day. God's truth and the world's trash is around us every single day. But here's the difference with it, okay? The difference is truth, you have to go and find. Trash just gets dumped on you. Have you ever noticed that? How easy it is to just get garbage thrown at you in your life. If you don't have enough garbage in your life, just open up social media. You'll, there's a lot of garbage on social media. Just turn on TV. Man, it's crazy how much stuff there is out there. Now, here's what I've realized is this, is that if we are in a place where we don't have enough truth, we will settle for trash. That, that our spirit is so hungry for something. And if we don't fill it with God's truth, it's crazy how we will fill our spirit with the trash that we see all around us. It's kind of like this. You know, when I was in college, I went there and I, I went to college on my own. 
And I remember, uh, you know, we came from, I came from a broken home. My dad was out of my life. My mom was struggling. And so I couldn't ask anyone for anything. So I was going to go to college. I wanted something better. So I went to college. And while I was in college studying to be an engineer, I remember that it was tough. I was going to school full time. I was trying to work full time. We were trying to pay the bills. My, my buddy Gary and I were like, we're trying to make this thing, you know, just trying to make it through. I got to tell you, it was so hard. So many times I, I, I thought I was going to quit college. I was like, I just can't do this. And we just said, look, just keep moving forward. Just keep moving forward. And there were times in our life uh, where we were in college that I can count at least, uh, at least on one hand, at least this many times where, where we had no food. And we were hungry. But my, my buddy Gary, he actually worked at Bash's. And so he told me, he's like, hey, Juan, you know that? that they throw away, like, good food. Like, if it starts getting yellow or, start, there's, or maybe there's a section that's going bad, they'll, they'll throw it all away. And I'm like, really? He's like, yeah. He's like, so, so because he worked there, I knew the days they'd throw it away. And I still remember one day when I was like, we were starving. We're like, we, we got to do this. And you know what I did is I actually went over there. He told me the day. I jumped in the trash can, started opening up bags. And I was going, okay. So, I, I, you know, we, we got things that were half rotted, and we started cutting things off, and, and, and we ate that. Here's what I realized. If you're starving enough, you're willing to eat trash. And spiritually speaking, we have a, a world that's starving spiritually. And, and they don't understand that the only thing that will quench them, the only thing that would fill them is God's truth. But because they're not filling themselves daily with God's truth, this is why we tell, tell you all the time, spend time in God's word. You know what that's doing? It's just filling you spiritually. So that when trash c- comes in your way, you, you notice it as trash. You notice it as, it as it what it really is, and you don't want to ingest it. Instead, you go, you know what, I see what that is, but I'm already filled with God. I'm filled with God's Holy Spirit, so I don't need that in my life. But when you are starving spiritually, I promise you, you take all that stuff in. And where does trash come from? It's everywhere. It's in entertainment. It's crazy. You know, the other day, my, my daughter showed me this song, and I'm like, oh, my goodness. The song said this. It said, people say that money can't buy you happiness. But those people must not, ha- not, must not have had that enough money. And I'm like, oh. And I was like, really? And then I thought about it. I started, I, and I was like, is that what all these people in Hollywood that have committed suicide thought? Because guess what? They had more money than we could ever dream of. There are people who had everything financially, and they committed suicide. They ended their life. They did drugs t- to, k- to kill themselves. Why? Why? Because money didn't buy happiness. And they had more money than what this girl now is singing about. And it's crazy. But you know what's interesting? How much of our society buys into that? That the only time I can be happy is if I have it all together. If I can, if I can keep up with that person. If, that as long as I have this and that's a new thing that I have, then I'll be happy. Well, you get that new thing and guess what? You realize you're not happy. It can't bring you true contentment and true joy. You know, sometimes the trash that we hear can be advice from the wrong people. I always tell people this, that whoever you go to for wise counsel, make sure that they have two things in place, okay? The first one's the most important one, that they love God. Then the second one is they love you. And here's the reason that's so important. It needs to be in that order. They love God and then they love you. Here's the reason. Because if they love God, they're going to want God's best in your life. And if they love you, they're going to tell you what God says. But if they love you more than they love God, they will tell you what you want to hear. And those people often will lead you in the wrong direction. Why? Because they just want you to be happy. They, they don't realize that, that you being happy in this moment right now will lead you to destruction later on. And I, I've had people come to me and tell me, they said, you know what? I'm going I'm to divorce my, my spouse. Why? And I'm going to chase this, this relationship that I've been pursuing online because they make me feel good. And, and, and my friend told me that God really just wants me happy. I'm like, no, no. You know what? Yes, God wants you to be full of joy and God can bring joy in your marriage. But part of it right now is you're, you're, you're off. You're, you're misfocused. Get refocused. You know, I've had people tell me that the reason they're in this, this addiction and they don't want to, they, they don't kick the addiction. They're always drinking. They're always, you know, smoking. They're shooting up. They're doing this. They said, you know what? Ultimately, God just wants you happy. So if it makes you happy, just do that. They had friends tell them that. And you know what I tell them? Those aren't your friends. Because if they really love you, they want what's best for you. And that is destruction. Sometimes the lies come from our own mind. Okay, raise your hands. Who here has ever convinced yourself to do something and after you did it you're like oh my goodness what did I just do I made a mistake yes absolutely you know that's all of us for those of you who did not raise your hand next week we're talking about lying okay so that'll be next week's message right that's all of us we can convince ourselves to do something 
So it says that we have to focus on God's truth. And God's truth doesn't just come naturally. God's truth doesn't just come by osmosis. It requires us to do something. Listen to what it says here in Proverbs chapter 2, verses 2 through 5. It says this. It says, tune your ears to wisdom and concentrate on understanding. Try, uh, cry out for insight and ask for understanding. Search for them as you would for silver. Seek them like hidden treasures. Then you will understand what it means to fear the Lord, to have reverence for God, to understand how incredible and mighty God is, and you will gain knowledge of God. So it says here that the way you do this is by, first of all, tuning in, tuning your ears to wisdom. Now, I know in today's society, a lot of people don't understand tuning in. Right? And, and part of the reason is what we have now is the, the, the radios that we have now, all you do is you hit a button. You know, you hit the forward button, you can change the channel. Like if, hey, you have this radio station, all you do is go boop and change to the next radio station. And it jumps. You can be like on, on, a, on a low number over here, like 88.1, and you can jump up to 104.9 over here with one button. Back in the day, I'm about to give you guys some history on the radio. Back in the day, we had radios that what you had to do is they had these two knobs right? And so these two knobs, and, it would, and you would have to move this little orange bar. It had numbers on the front. And, and, the, and when you turn this one, it would actually move the orange bar. And they, some of them, some of the other ones had, had buttons where you could do it, and it kind of would jump into the vicinity, right? It would kind of go boom, and then you're like, okay, I still... But you still had to get in there and fine-tune it. What was wild is this, is that you would have a station that would be, that you couldn't even hear at all, and you would t- turn the knob, and all of a sudden you can hear it, and you go a little too far, you come back, and then you kind of do this thing. And then finally you're like, oh, there it is, there it is. You want to know what's wild? The information that the station was putting out, it was always there. You just couldn't hear it because you were out of tune. Sometimes that's what's true about God, God's word in our life. God gives us everything that we need to live the life that he has planned for us, to be the people that he intended for us to be, to, to have a life of impact, He gives us everything. But what we have to do is go back and continually, continually. Have you ever noticed those old those old radios? You could you can have it tuned right now, but you drive about five miles, you have to retune again. That's what happens in our life. See, there are times in our life where we are well tuned to what God wants for our life, and then all of a sudden we start kind of going through life. And have you noticed sometimes you get out of tune? Today's a tuning day. Today's the day to go, okay, where am I? I need to make sure that I am tuned on what God wants for my life. And and the other thing that it said in that text, it said this. It says, you should seek God's wisdom, his knowledge, his understanding like silver, like something precious, like a hidden treasure. Now think about this. Okay, if I told you that in your backyard, I put $100 million, but here's what you have to do. You have to take a shovel and you got to start digging to find it. All of you right now would run out and go buy a shovel. You'd go, absolutely. You would start putting the work in. You know, some of you would go, I'm going to have my husband do it. Well, whatever it is. But you're going to have somebody start getting in there and start shoveling. Why? Because the treasure's worth it. It says that's the kind of heart we need to have towards God's wisdom, towards God's word. Because the treasure that it gives us, like I said before, you can have all the money in the world and still not have contentment. God's word is what gives us contentment and joy. Now, let's look at the last and final thing today. It says, doing what God says. This is the final thing that keeps us on fire, refocused on God's priorities. We need to be committed to doing what God says. Now, this one here is the toughest one. It really is. And this one here, if we don't do this one, all the other three are irrelevant. It, it, it does nothing. Because you can go through pain, and you could also know that, that God has your best in mind. You could know the Bible frontwards and backwards. You can recite every verse. But if you do nothing with it, it does you no good. You, could not, you, do, you would not have transformation in your life. It's not just about a head knowledge of God. It's about a relationship with God. And we walk day in and day out pursuing what God wants for us. But here's the thing. We could have all of that and still be in pain when we don't obey, when we don't actually do I think about like what happened with me yesterday. You know, yesterday, remember I, I told you I like basketball? And so yesterday, I decided to play basketball. Now, it was a bad decision because three weeks ago, I, I actually pulled my Achilles and I was in pain for a while. And so I started feeling good. And so this last, this last Wednesday, I went back to the gym again. I was like, okay, I'm gonna go back to doing HIT training. You know, it's a high intensity training. And so I kid you not, during the warm up, 
I did it again, it popped, and I'm like, oh no, I dropped. I mean, the, you know, the, the trainer who was, he was actually here first service had to lift me up and move me over to a chair, and I was in pain. And so yesterday, you know, I was over at, at a friend's house for, uh, for, for his son's graduation, and while, while I was there, uh, they went outside, they started playing basketball, and I was like, I'm just gonna watch. That's all, I'm just gonna watch. And so I went out there, and I was watching it, and I was like, I could take him. You know, so... So I was like, I'm going to go play. I'm like, but here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to just shoot from the three-point. I'm not going to run. I'm, I'm just going to shoot from the three-point. My first shot missed it completely. I'm like, oh, wow, that was bad. I know what I need. I just need to drive. All right, so I'm going to drive into the basket. So, so I started playing, and I kid you not, I kid you not, I think I played no more than 15 minutes. I hurt my leg twice. I ended up, you know, limping out. This morning, I woke up, and I was trying to walk down the stairs, and I, I kid you not, I was going to fall over. I was like, huh, 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 as I was trying to come down the stairs. Right now, it looks like I'm moving okay. I'm faking it. Yeah, I'm in so much pain. Oh, it's crazy. It's crazy. But here's the thing. The th- I was in pain the last two weeks. So I had the pain. I, my trainer told me, my wife told me, people told me, Angela, who was there, said, you shouldn't play basketball. It's going to hurt you. And I went, so now I understand that they care for me. I had the knowledge of what could happen. But because I didn't do anything with it, I ended up being in pain again. Why do we do that? Have you noticed that we do that in life when it comes to big things as well? It's like we can have everything, but we need to put it in practice. Listen to what it says here in Matthew chapter 3, verse 8. In Matthew 3, 8, Jesus says this, Therefore, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Here's what this means. Remember, we talked about the word repentance. It says that the repentance literally means that you change the way you think and you change the way you act. So it says there, now, bear fruit in keeping with that. That as you change the way you think and as you change the way you act, that now your, bo- your, your life will start to produce things. That Things are going to start coming out of your life. And those things that start coming out of your life are going to be things that, that will make a difference. That things, the things that come out of your life when you're doing the right thing versus doing the wrong thing are going to be very different. You know, we always talk about, you know, uh, what you plant today is what you're going to reap tomorrow. So make sure that what you're planting today is worth having multiple tomorrow. Because whatever you plant you will always get a whole lot more of later. So, so plant the right things in your life. Now, people say, well, I get that. And I want to have a life that, that, that really does produce good and, and, and have an impact. But, but Pastor Juan, when I look at the Bible, it's intimidating. You know, if you have a paper Bible, it's like that big, depending on the font. If you have a really small font, you can go like that big. You know, some people go, or if you have the iPad, it's this big. Just keep it. You know, but, but whatever it is, you, you look at the Bible, and it's, it can be intimidating. Like, how do I do that? Like, how do I follow God with everything I've got? And we can look at it, and oftentimes, we allow the intimidation of all God's word, you know, that we, as we look at it, to paralyze us from taking our next step. I want you to know something. It's not about you doing everything in the Bible today. It's about just taking your next step today. One thing. Choose one thing. The Apostle Paul talks about this. The Apostle Paul, who was a guy who literally transformed the world, that he, he took the, the good news of Jesus Christ to the known world. This guy was absolutely incredible. And I want you to see what he says here in Philippians chapter 3, verses 13 and 14. Listen to what it says. It says, brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet. To me, I'm blown away that he even says that. This is a guy who literally spread God's word incredibly. And he says, I don't have it all figured out. He's like, I'm still learning. I'm still growing. But then he goes on. But one thing I do. How many things did he do? One, there it is. One thing he does. One thing. And I love what the one thing is because it's actually what we're talking about today is refocusing. He says, one thing I do is I'm staying focused on what I need to do. He says, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead. I'm not going to focus on the past because that's already gone. I can't change that. I'm not going to keep looking back because that'll just get me in the wrong direction. But instead, I'm going to look forward. I'm going to reach forward to what lies ahead. And I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Jesus Christ. He's like, I'm going to focus on God's plan, on God's purpose for my life. That, that my one thing is get refocused. So today, for some of us, that's our one thing. We've allowed God to become a spoke. Today's pro- the day to refocus and bring him back to being the hub that he is a part of everything that we do. You know, maybe that one thing for some people today is to confess a struggle that you're dealing with, to go in and talk to somebody and say, look, I'm going through this thing. I really need some help. That I, I, I have this problem. I have this hurt. And right now, I don't know how to get through it. 
Maybe that thing is something that, you're, that you've done that you have shame and regret for. Go talk to somebody. Talk to us. We'll, we want to help you through that. We're not here to judge you. We, I, I said this before, that our job isn't to look down on you. The only time we ever look down on anyone is we we're there to lift them back up and to walk with you and to help you take your next step in your relationship with God. You know, and people say, well, well, if I do that, people are going to know that I have problems. Let, let me tell you a secret. Let me tell you a secret, okay? We all have problems. See, a Christian isn't someone who has all their problems figured out. A Christian is someone who understands that they're in need of a Savior. See, we're not perfect. I'm so glad that God doesn't look for perfect people. You know why? Because we would all be jacked. (laughs) Absolutely. But God looks at us, broken people, and says, I sent a perfect Savior so that you can get refocused and live the life that I intended for you. Look, you might have been derailed. Maybe God wasn't even a spoke on your wheel, but today you can say, I'm ready for God to be the hub of my life, and I'm ready to move forward. Maybe today what you're doing is to go and ask someone for forgiveness. Maybe you've done something to someone, and you need to say, look, I'm sorry. Please forgive me for what I've done. Maybe today you just need to commit to reading your Bible. That maybe that's your step, that you, you haven't been reading your Bible daily. I always tell people, read it every day. For five minutes at least, just spend time in God's word every day. Fill yourself spiritually so that we don't eat the trash of the world. And we can acknowledge it as of what it really is. Fill yourself. Maybe that's your one thing, or maybe your one thing today is just to, to take your first step, which is to give your life to Jesus. Maybe you've never committed your life to Christ, and you're saying, look, I'm ready. I want to live the life that God intended for me, and I'm ready to take that step of faith. Listen, why wait another day? You can choose today. It reminds me of a vine that we have in our backyard. We have a grapevine that's actually really wide now. I could actually could probably go from here to there. And, you know, we have these grapevines that grow up. And when that vine first started, we actually put a little metal trellis above it. And so the vine started kind of growing through the trellis. And one thing you're supposed to do is after the vine starts getting big, you're supposed to remove the trellis. Now, if I would have done that, it would have been a whole lot easier. But I left the little metal trellis on there, and the vine was growing through it, and it kind of grew up and over. And so it had like these little knots in the trellis, and the vine grew in there, and it started growing thicker and thicker and thicker. And it was the wildest thing, because I, one day I looked in there, and, I, and my wife told me, she's like, babe, can you take that, that trellis off? And I looked at it, I'm like, wow. Something that I could have just pulled out if I would have caught it early. Because I didn't catch it early, the vine actually started growing over the trellis, so it actually got embedded into it. It actually scarred the vine. So I had to get my grinder out. And I was like, Rrr. so I cut, the, cut this thing out. And, and some of the metal was actually stuck inside the vine, so I had to get in there and rip it out of there. Now, if you look at the vine today, it's been a couple years now, the vine, you can still see a scar. It's healing, but you can see a scar. If I would have took care of it when I needed to, it would have never been scarred or the scarring would have been a whole lot less. Why is it that too often we wait when God says, you don't have to carry this anymore. Right now, we can pull that, pull, it, pull that trellis off. Don't let it hold you. Don't let it stop you from growing. Don't let it hurt you anymore. Today can be the day saying, Jesus, I accept what you've done and I'm ready for you to free me from my past. If that's you, after the service, please, Pastor Don will be back there at the Red Connections table. Head back there. We want to talk to you about taking your next step in your relationship with God. I'll be right up here. I'd love to talk to you about that uh, as well. And again, remember this. With God, the best is yet to come. Let's pray. Father, we just want to thank you so much for today. We thank you, Father, for the opportunity that we get a chance to step back and to just ask yourselves the question, are we focused? Are you really the hub of our life? Or, Father, for a lot of us, if you've become a spoke, If you're just a part of our life, but not the center of everything that we do, we pray that today that we can get refocused. Because, Father, when you are the center of our life, it reminds us that you have a plan, you have a purpose for us. Father, we can accomplish so much more when we live out your will rather than our own, than our own desires. So help us to pursue you with everything we've got. Father, help us to understand that when we're in a painful situation, that it's a time to evaluate, to step back and ask ourselves, is there something in my life that I need to get get fixed? But, Father... Also, if we're following you with everything we've got, help us to remember that there is an enemy that always tries to distract us, so we're not going to let the pain get us distracted. Instead, we're going to focus on you, and you're going to get us through it. Father, we pray that we don't ever forget that you have your best interest in mind, or our best interest in your mind, and we thank you so much for that. We thank you for loving us the way that you do. We thank you, Father, that there are times where, you know, you're going to give us that spinach, but the whole point is to later on to get us healthy. And we pray that as we look at that, that things happen in our life, that we always know that you want our best. Father, help us to focus on your truth. And Father, help us to remember 
that it's not just about knowing your word, but it's about living it. Father, we pray in our son, Jesus' name, amen. Thank you guys so much for being here. I love you so much, church. Have an amazing week. See you guys next week. Thanks, everyone.